They did? Oh. That's, uh, that's right on the stick! The big yeah, controversy was the default. Uh, let's see if I can find out. I'm telling you, I'm going pin seeking, I'm throwing darts, I want Mickelson. Tasty. Max Scherzer is among eight players on baseball's executive subcommittee, which means he's probably a mouthpiece for Scott Boris, his agent, and which I understand. Scott Boris is trying to get the most for his clients because his clients make the most money. But Scherzer said that after discussing the latest developments with the rest of the players, there's no need to engage with MLB in any further compensation reductions. We have previously negotiated a pay cut in the version of a prorated salary, no justification to accept a second pay cut based upon current information the union has received. All right, this doesn't matter to us on a day-to-day -day basis. Certainly doesn't matter to us right now. We don't care about this once the season starts. All you want to do is have baseball. Nobody's feeling bad for a billionaire, and you're probably not feeling bad for Max Scherzer or some of these other guys who make more than $20 million a year. But we can understand what they're giving up to come back. And the players are the ones taking the risk to come back, not these owners. So I, I see both sides, and, and I, I hate to go right down the middle on this, but I've been involved in these things, covering negotiations before. I've covered lockouts. I've covered strikes. I know how this works. You put out information you want put out. And you want it disseminated, and then you hopefully get public sentiment on your side. And that it feels like the owners, Major League Baseball, they've leaked every possible document possibly. That's every possible document possibly. And uh, now you have the players saying, well, wait a minute, now we got to strike back here. And, you know, it's just uncomfortable. It's a bad look for baseball. You got the NBA trying to figure it out inside, in house, NHL. Inside, in-house, Major League Baseball, open the windows, open the doors. Everybody come on in. See what we got here. It's a bad look. And they got to get this under one roof here, figure it out, what makes the most sense, because we as fans don't want to hear anything about this. We don't. I couldn't care less. I want them to play baseball. Figure it out. If you don't make your money now, make it up later. If you're an owner, make it up later. If you're a player, make it up later. But we don't want to hear about it. Just play. Figure it out. Get back. There's other things to worry about. And obviously, these negotiations going on, baseball made their proposal. Uh, and uh, it was uh, effectively a non-starter for the union. The idea of the sliding scale. I think the way to look at it is owners have proclaimed that they're going to lose 40% of the revenues without fans in the stands. That includes ticket sales, concessions, parking, all of that. That it's 40%. The proposal they made to the players on taking a pay cut off of the prorated salary is a sliding scale that impacts guys differently depending upon how much money they make. But effectively, on average, they're asking the players to take a 33% pay cut. Now, so effectively, the 40% loss, they're actually putting 33% of that on the players and only holding 7% of that themselves from the owner's perspective. So it's a non-starter for the players. They don't like the sliding scale and the way it's sort of spread out. Uh, and so the union now looking to put together a counter proposal that we're hearing is going to be prorated salaries. That's it. And we want more games. And from the owner's perspective, they're looking at it saying we lose about six hundred eighty thousand dollars per game paying prorated salaries without fans in the stands. More games is worse for the owners and it pushes the regular season deeper into the fall where the owners have a real concern that they might lose the playoffs with the second wave of the virus. And the playoffs is the biggest line item of revenue for owners right now, that playoff share of the network money. They can't put that at risk. And so therein lies the problem in this negotiation. You, of course, were the GM with the Mets with the Bobby Bonilla deal. And I'm wondering, is I think it allowed you guys to sign Mike Hampton. Is, is that fair to say? It freed up some money. But if you look back on that deal, would you make that deal again with Bobby Bonilla? Yeah. So so remember, we were releasing Bobby Bonilla and and ownership said, you know, that that his group, his his agency uh, had represented Daryl Strawberry back in the day. Uh, where they had done deferred compensation. And Bonilla, people don't know this, when he first signed with the Mets the first time around, he had deferred compensation with them too. He still gets some payments from that first 
deal he made with the Mets the deferred <laughs> compensation. Uh, and so, you know, here, here's the thought on that, though, was the Mets looked at it at the time is we had Bernie Madoff as an investment vehicle. So the Mets looked at deferring Bonilla's compensation as a way for the team to make money, that they were going to take his, I think it was 6.8 million or whatever that number was, release him and then invest that money with Madoff and put it out for 10 years, not paying Bonilla anything, and then spread it out over 25 years of payments, of equal payments. And, the, and so I was just told, hey, give it to the accounting department, let them crunch numbers. And if Madoff returned this percentage or that percentage or that percentage, how much money would he make on Bonilla's money? And the notion was that we had a chance to make millions on his deal, even with the payout for Bonilla over that period of time. And so quite honestly, it was turning what was a loss of 6.8 million in a single year of releasing him into what would be a, a win and a financial windfall for the organization because of the Madoff investments. I've known Sandler for 25 years, I think. And I, I he wasn't putting me in a movie. I wasn't asking to be in a movie, but I knew that he was going to do a movie called Waterboy, and he wanted to cash in on ESPN's popularity, sports centers, and uh, he used me on that as one of the broadcasters, one of the sportscasters on there. I think he used some other people. I think Jim Rome is in that movie. Peter King is in that movie. But, you know, they want some, wanted some authenticity. And Sandler just said, whatever lines you want, say whatever you want, but, you know, this is the scene and these are the highlights there. So he let me do basically a highlight via Sports Center, and uh, and then I was at a Knicks game, and I went out into like the bowels of the stadium, Madison Square Garden, and Sandler was out there by himself, and I just walked up to him. I said, "Hey, Sandman," and and he looked up and he goes, "Danny P, your boy, he bleeped me," and I go, "What?" He goes, "Your boy Oberman, he bleeped me." I go, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, he was supposed to show up for Happy Gilmore and he couldn't fly and we had to get uh, Vern Lundquist in there and, and whatever. And I said, look, if you ever need somebody, you let me know, I'm going to be there for you. And uh, he goes, all right, you're Danny McBleep and Patrick and you're going to be a police officer in my next movie and you're going to wear a mustache. I didn't think anything of it. I just laughed and I laughed. Well, we did the longest yard and I'm there in one of the early scenes as a police officer with a mustache as I arrest Sandler. And after that, he would just write in parts for me. He would just say, Danny got a part for you. And then he would tell me what it was. And then he would send me the script, tell me when to show up. And that was it. And I think it's been 17 movies. He even put me in as a police officer with Anna Ferris. House Bunny. And uh, I was a police officer in House Bunny. I See, I like that one. That was a good little, uh, good, good scene there. I didn't know all the stars who were in it because I'm only there for one day. Actually, I was there for a night because my scene was in the evening. But I think you had a couple of, you know, big time uh, stars. Who was it? Uh, uh, who was the star of the uh, Easy A? Oh, Emma Stone. Emma Stone. I think Emma Stone is in there in the sorority. But I had no idea. Anna Ferris was very talented. She had no idea who I was, as per usual with most of the women. I like when he, you know, I meet uh, Aniston on a movie set, and he goes, uh, Danny, you know Aniston? I have no idea who Jennifer Aniston is. And then I know who she is, and then uh, you know he goes, uh, uh, Danny's the sports guy. So I was the sports guy the whole week when I was in uh, Hawaii with Aniston. I don't know if you saw the comments Dean Blandino made on uh, the show a couple of days ago where he said when he was in charge of the officials, there was a break glass in case of emergency where New York would contact the official on the field and say, guys, huddle up, because mm -hmm. as Dean said – you know, we were worried about something extreme, historically bad or controversial here. We contacted the NFL. The NFL said, we have no comment. And then I talked to a source who said, that's the way Dean did things, not the way we do things now. What do you make of that? Well, Dean was very close with a lot of the coaches and he had that trust with the coaches, Dan. And, and that's one thing that came up. I think that's been lost the last couple of years was a lot of the respect between the coaches and the league office was built by Dean Blandino. And so when Dean went into TV, I do think a little bit of that it was lost, which is where some of the issues have come in the last couple of years. I can also say this, 
like the sky judge it with certain crews has actually already existed and so i'll give you a great example everybody remembers the earl thomas hit on mason rudolph last year right yeah. so if you guys go back and watch that broadcast go pull it up on game pass or whatever watch when they cut to commercial after mason rudolph goes down there's no flag on the field when they come back from commercial there is a flag on the field it took about 35 to 40 seconds for the flag to go on the field. Well, what happened there? Well, John Harbaugh went over to the head referee and says, well, wait a second, where'd that flag come from? And the head <laughs> official said to him, the guy up in the booth told me to drop it because the, the hit was egregious. And Harbaugh said to the head official, oh, you mean like a sky judge? So they've actually been sort of using some of these things in spots over the last couple of years. I, I think the way that the, what the coaches really wanted was to formalize that, make sure everybody had the benefit of it. And again, this isn't coaches versus officials. The main thing for these coaches was giving the officials the benefit that every single one of us sitting at home with a cable subscription has, which is eight, 10, 12 different angles of crystal clear HD to see everything from. I think these coaches really thought it was crazy that the guys in the field weren't getting the, the, the benefit that tens of millions of people have, have have sitting on their couches every day. I don't understand that you want to take away the, the onside kick because you, you don't want another collision or collisions, but then you're going to have the marquee players who are going to come back out on the field for a fourth and 15. I would rather have the onside kickoff team than backup linebackers than I would. I got Patrick Mahomes back there for a fourth and 15. Yeah with the marquee players on the wide, you know, on the offense and then the defense, you know, it's a pass. I, I don't know. You're asking for contact there as well. I mean, is it a pass interference down to that's the other thing, right? Dan, yep. like, is it, I mean, fourth and 15, or do you have a better shot of converting that by just throwing it up to Julio Jones and hoping somebody yanks on his Jersey? You know what I mean? Like yeah. there are certain things like that that could come into play too. I actually talked to one coach and this may be a little conspiracy theory ish, but there are some coaches that feel like the NFL has, you know, actively looked to try to take the middle class out of the league and who's the middle class. Well, the middle class is guys like Matt Slater on the Patriots who are making three, $4 million a year and who are playing what, like probably six or eight plays a game. And so, you know, there are, there are, I think there, there is a feeling that there maybe are some, there are some ulterior motives here on the part of the owners. Um, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but but certainly I think that there are coaches that really feel like the kickoff is, you know, they've done a lot of work to try to keep the kickoff as is, and they really should try not to bastardize it too much. I was all excited about Sky Judge. I really yeah. was. And now it's being tabled. Why is it being tabled? And is the replay official getting some more responsibilities? Well, it's not really being, I mean, it's being tabled, but it's being tabled in the way that it was written um, by the coaches subcommittee. Um, and, and in particular that the Ravens coach, John Harbaugh and the Chargers coach, Anthony Lynn. And, and the, the difference between what they wanted to do and, and what's going to be going in, in an experimental basis um, is really about who the sky judge himself is. And the coaches really wanted it to be a more experienced guy. So either a, a retired head referee or a more experienced member of the crew with younger guys becoming the eighth member of the crew. They really wanted an experienced hand up. There's somebody that everybody could trust um, being in charge of monitoring the broadcast and being in charge of having that view up top, um, you know, and, 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 and really the league wasn't ready to take that step. And so Walt Anderson, who's become very involved over the last uh, four or five months, he, he was an on-field official until the end of the season. He's moved into a senior role in the NFL office now um, you know, he sort of suggested, hey, listen, the replay officials we have are good. We'll change out a few of them and we'll get some good guys in here. And then let's give this a shot in the preseason. And if it works in the preseason, let's try it in the regular season. And if it works in the regular season, we can expand on it in 2021. And so there's been a two year process for guys like John Harbaugh and Andy Reid and Anthony Lynn. And all these guys really just want to give the officials a resource. And the idea was to give them a high-end resource by giving them an experienced official up top. This is sort of the compromise where the replay official, the existing replay official, will have expanded duty. I yeah. clicked on the story. I think Todd added the question mark. Because I don't see the question mark in the story. Todd, did you ask the – did you put the question mark there? Did you edit this? You got to turn on your mic. That's how it works. I, I put a question mark in the headline. But um, in my headline, I'm like, for the subject of the uh, email. But, why are you doing that? But, Who the hell are you to put a question mark in the headline? 
because that was my that was my way of saying I'm like this is a surprising piece of news. Uh, uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, 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 who's the number one, he's supposed to be ahead of two, and all of a sudden. But you're not the that, editorial staff here for Bleacher Report. I'm not. I took a I took a little liberty there. I guess. That I apologize saying, to like, Mike Freeman. I didn't know that Todd was all of a sudden going to be editing this. Here. That was my question as to really this is interesting. Tua could be starting. Okay. I need. So to- wait a minute. Hold on a second. Is because there's two question marks, right? There's the subject of Todd's email that says Tua starting week one question mark, and then the next part is foregone conclusion Tua will start week one question mark. Todd, did you put both of those question marks in? Anything in the actual copy, I did not put a question mark. But my, my only question mark was in the uh, subject line. I clicked on the story. There's no question mark. Okay. Well, I'm glad that you brought that to our attention. Do you want to apologize on behalf of this? I guess the, I have the, the to. Show. It's a journalistic faux pas. I wasn't but it says foregone conclusion. The, uh... It says foregone conclusion, Todd. That's what he's. That's what's being reported. I know, but you don't. If you want to put after we, we'll start week one. Period. Then you put. Boy, I have a question mark about this. But or, the Dolphins have the Dolphins announced that he's the starting quarterback. No, Until the Dolphins announced he's the starting no, quarterback. Don't, he's don't try it, Todd. Don't try it. How Just did, because some wait, some sources are saying that it's a foregone conclusion until the Dolphins come out and say our starting quarterback week one is Tua, then that's a question mark to me. When does a reporter get to tell a team who's to, starting quarterback? For him, he's not putting a question mark after this. In you his did. report. Yes. Underlined report. It's still a report. It's not fact. It's a report. I know, but you... He's, I understand what you're saying, and I... And I he I, says I, it's I, a I foregone conclusion. Things. That's his his report, his opinion. It's a foregone conclusion. That's great. I think the reason why I put the question mark in, not to confuse you and the All rest right. of the well, audience, then I apologize. was because the Dolphins have not said that he's the starting No, that's not the way this works. That's not the way this works. So I caused a journalistic uh, piece of confusion there. Yes, you did. So I will apologize for that. Well, doesn't sound like you want to. I'll be more careful with my punctuation. and my. Uh, no, you can say, lines. boy, I got questions about this. But you've added a question mark in the title. The I probably should have put really question mark. There, that would have been good. Like that that would have been good. Leave it for interpretation after that. Do you have suggestions on that? Of do we make it twenty because there's four teams that are closer in the West for that final playoff spot? Well, Dan, I think first of all, uh, to me, uh, and I've said this before, and I don't know what they'll do, but I think they need to have at least. Uh, teams should play at least 72 games, okay, because it's only 12 less in the regular season. And also it gives the teams that are on the bubble and trying to make the playoff, it'll give them a chance to uh, get in there and compete at a high level uh, to try to get into the playoffs. And then I'm not sure how the playoff format would work or not. Would they expand a little bit more? Uh, I think the most awkward thing and the questions we ask all of these really fun people that we've that we've uh, been involved with great players in a lot of respective fields what their advice might be and the, you know the one thing i think most people don't realize when you're trying to uh stimulate your players and keep them involved with with their friends and also their teammates is communication and the league is communicating as much as they can there's a lot of things they have to c- take in consideration here but uh, this is obviously, Dan, an awkward time in trying to uh, figure out what the dynamics are going to be. People are talking about playing in a bubble with both with both uh, with no fans. I'm not sure how they could do it in one place. Uh, to me, it would be better to let the teams in the West say play in Las Vegas, where there's facilities there, plenty of hotel rooms, and in Orlando, uh, uh, keep the teams in the East. Uh, that would make it a little bit easier, I think. Also, to satisfy the contents of um, our relationship with ESPN, our relationship with TNT, and all our providers uh, who are broadcasting the games were people who are, frankly, starving for competition. What about the possibility that you could have a Lakers-Clippers NBA Finals if we're just going to seed it 1 through 16 and not have the East Coast-West Coast, Jerry? Well... Well, for me, Dan, that, that would be the ultimate competition. I think in Los Angeles, you know, they have so many Laker fans. My goodness, uh, the enormous success that the Lakers have had over the years. 
Uh, they have a really good team now. Um, you know, two of the best players we've seen in a long time on one team. Um, I think it would be incredible for the team, the people in the West. I'm not sure how that would go over for uh, for the teams back East who want to see their respective teams get an opportunity to play. But uh, that would be a, a situation where I think it would be unbelievably competitive. It would be compelling that I don't know how many teams in the same city have competed for a championship in any sport, uh, much less the, the NBA. Uh, but it's a it would make a compelling story. But uh, in all likelihood, I think you're going to see uh, things that are um, that'll be a little bit more, more normal without offending any of the teams. We have a lot of teams in this league, and it's not about one or two teams. Uh, a league is comprised of, of all of the teams, all the players. And what you want, more importantly, what you want, you want competition a bit against the best teams. To me, it was about, you know, you played, you played for the city, uh, you played for the organization, and you played to have success. And all of those things for me uh, were, were what drove me in my career. And, you know, I look back and, you know, watch these guys today with all, and Kobe and Michael, obviously, Michael, I think, first started in his desire to get fitter, stronger, uh, and be able to, to compete against the Pistons, who, who were notoriously uh, um, physical. And uh, at that point in time, I think their presence in the league probably helped change the league because some of the fouls that they committed were very <laughs> hard. But this had gone on for years, and because of Detroit success, certainly uh, um, they didn't care who it was. Your fanny was going to be in their ground if you're in the air going for a lay -in. But uh, they helped change the rules, to be honest with you. But uh, Michael Michael started this. Uh, you could see the difference in him uh, in a couple of years. Just how um, just how big, how much bigger he got, leaner looking, and I don't think I've ever seen an athlete like him that has ever been that explosive and the quickness and his ability to run. Uh, I read somewhere uh, that M Michael said he like he ran like a four three forty, yeah, and he wasn't even pushing it. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, how can you have that kind of, uh, of running ability and the enormous quick leaping ability he had. I don't know what his vertical was, but it was ridiculous. But the skill involved just put him in another class. Yeah, not fair. Mm -hmm.